Hi there. Good morning. Welcome to everybody. It's been a, a while since I've seen everybody face to face. And it's challenging indeed uh, to do what we are doing and missing one another so much. But I want to share God's word with you this morning. And I trust that today is going to be a day of a breakthrough for many of you. It's a real challenge to do it like this, especially because part of being a church is having the experience of looking each other in the eye while we are listening to the word of God and saying, this is speaking to me. I see it speaking to you. We are under God's word and this is how important this is to us. It's a huge challenge in today's life to become a disciple of Jesus Christ spending approximately only 52 hours a year, one hour a week, becoming a disciple. And if we're going to do it like that, we're not going to get very far. It needs to be something that we're doing every single day. And the top up on Sunday is a connection point to point us in the right direction. And we're going to need to work in that direction, Jesus and you and me, on a day-to-day -day basis so that we're growing and allowing the joy of the Lord to be your strength because becoming Christ-like and becoming a disciple of Jesus and doing what he wants us to do is the greatest privilege and joy of any human being. But I want to encourage you, I'm going to go into part two of possessing your inheritance. It's a series we began last week and we were looking at the... Uh, story of Joshua. We read Joshua chapter 1 and the strategy that God gave Joshua to take hold of his inheritance in the land. We know that God gave him the inheritance. He had the legal right from God to take the land, but he still had to move in and take possession. And we're looking at in our lives how Jesus Christ has given us an inheritance that's based in heaven, that's unshakable, part of the kingdom of God. But you don't get to access your inheritance until you take possession of it. And there are things that we need to do to take possession of our inheritance. And today what we're going to be looking at is what did Joshua have to overcome? How did he take possession? And then we're going to start the process of looking at how do we begin to take possession of our inheritance. And we're going to begin just touch on, because there's quite a lot to it, of what is, what is needed by you and I to take hold of what God has prepared for us. And there is the most incredible inheritance. Everything that you need is already made available in Christ Jesus. But one of the challenges is, as just as Joshua and Caleb and the other ten spies noticed, there are giants in the land. What are the giants? They are the things inside of us that we need to overcome so that we can live out the inheritance that Christ has put in us. So we're going to look at a little bit of the Old Testament, begin to understand the Old Testament picture, and then get to start on the New Testament and what happens inside of us. And of course, the Old Testament is the best picture you're going to get of some of the things they had to do. And then it becomes a map or a pointer that helps us to identify what we need to do for us today. So I trust that you will find the Bible journey interesting, but also challenging as to how we're going to get there. So this is part two. There is a part three. What was the Old Testament inheritance? And then what is the New Testament inheritance and part four, occupying and keeping your inheritance and your internal inheritance. And I'm going to begin by reading in Exodus 23 and uh, from verse 20 onwards. And of course, now this is before the time that Joshua is leading the nation. Moses is still leading the nation and he has identified who the nations are that have to be overcome in the promised land. And he says in verse 20. Behold. 
I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversary. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them, and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and He will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days." I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the Sea Philistia, and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. What a wonderful promise. And I want to go right back to the beginning. A very interesting thing that, that he said here. Behold, I will send, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Now you will notice, and I trust that some of you will have read the book of Joshua. And just early in the story of Joshua, you find a moment where Joshua is alone. And he goes off basically to pray and to think. And there... He meets the angel or the captain general of the army of the hosts of the Lord. And this is none other than a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus himself. We know Jesus at the, in the book of Revelation coming, leading the armies of the Lord. We know Jesus is a general. And with whatever he says goes... And he gives Joshua some clear instructions. And every time he gives Joshua instructions, they have victory. If they don't, do not consult the Lord, they have a defeat. And there we have it. Beware of him and obey his voice. So obedience is a key part of overcoming. But this is a very clear instruction to Joshua. But it's given in Exodus. That's basically 40 years before they go into the land. Later on, Joshua experienced this promise. And a very interesting, and we meet, there are these one, two, three, four, five, six nations that need to be displaced. And there are clear instructions about that they're not to be involved in idolatry and don't get involved in their culture overthrow them, destroy all their, their idols and only serve the Lord and he will bless you. And there are some incredible blessings involved. Now we know that the blessings in Christ Jesus are based on better promises. So if these are good, how much more is the promises that Jesus has for you as a believer in your life? So let's go straight to get dive into it. Where do we want to be? We want to be possessing the land. We want to be living in God's blessings. And we want to be occupying and taking hold of every blessing Jesus paid for at Calvary. Now, when we look at the Old Testament and the stories in the Old Testament, we are looking at them with a view to saying, okay, these are the Old Testament principles that still apply to us. So when we look at the Old Testament stories, 
it's not just, wow, this is a, uh, an interesting story. Because some Christians just love to gain knowledge. And the more knowledge they have about the Bible, the better they feel. But it's not about hearing. It's about being equipped for doing. And the best thing about the Old Testament is that it points to the New Testament and tells us how we should live in Christ. So the Old Testament principles still apply. Now, there is a question in your life. And as we are listening to the Old Testament, start looking into your life and saying, what are the nations, inverted commas, still occupying your life? What are the giants that are in your land? And how are we going to overcome those giants so that you can inherit your inheritance? That you can possess your inheritance? Because if there are giants in the land, they are taking up the place where you will be blessed. If there's a giant, uh, if there are giants in Jericho in your life, the area around Jericho is not available for you to live in because that area is being occupied by the enemy. And every area in our lives that is occupied by the enemy means that we cannot possess our inheritance in that area because the enemy is occupying that place. So what are the nations currently living in the place? And Joshua had to destroy the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So we're going to briefly look at each of those just to understand a bit of Bible background knowledge. And um, then we'll go into that. But let's... And then he was told to kill them. Now this might be a little bit challenging. Why would God not say, chase them out or, you know, just conquer them and live with them? Maybe integrate with them. God says, kill them all. In fact, he says, don't leave any of them. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, this is Deuteronomy 18 and verse 6, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of these nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Now, why did God tell these, tell Israel to destroy these nations? It's because of the incredible levels of witchcraft that they were involved in. There was normal, it was normal for the Canaanites to take their firstborns and sacrifice them in a fire, they would actually go and there would be a statue of, of Molech whose arms would be out and there would be a fire burning between his hands. And they would put their firstborn child alive into the fire and burn him alive. That was how they got spiritual power. They were con there was the most incredible levels of human sacrifice and witchcraft. And in the time of Abraham already, many generations before, they had been warned not to do these things. These nations were descended from Noah's son Canaan. And each of these nations were sons of, the, of Canaan. And they were, except so much for the Hittites, the Hittites were a major empire they were an equivalent size empire to the size of Egypt. But most of them were Canaanite people descended from Canaan. And they had occupied that land and they had been confronted with the truth generations before. 
They had already had 40 years of warning, knowing that this nation is living in the wilderness and is coming in. And they still persisted in practicing all of these abominations. And God was tired. He'd warned them. They had refused to obey him. There was no repentance from them. And God decided that Israel was going to be used to judge these nations who were practicing such abominations, it says. So what were they supposed to do? They had to kill them all and don't leave any of them. Any you leave will be a snare to the next generation. And there's to be no compromise and going after their idols. Don't marry them. Don't follow after their abominations. Destroy their idols. Now what does that say to you and I? It's saying that we need to get serious about the things that are in our lives, the giants in our lives, the things that we think it's okay to leave there. It's fine. You know what? These things don't matter. I can live with this. I will go to church or I will be a Christian. I'll say my prayers. You should not be saying prayers. You should be praying. You might as well say, Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. For all that saying prayers matters. Its fleece was black as soot. And everywhere that Mary went, it's sooty footy put. That's all you might as well be saying if you're saying prayers. If you are praying with all of your heart, there's a, a moment deep in our hearts that says, this is not right, Lord. I need to get this right with you. I'm sorry about it. Is there a way that I can walk by the leading of your Holy Spirit into truth and get rid of those giants in that area in my life? Am I going to be serious about possessing my land? Because otherwise I won't get my inheritance to the fullest. That is the challenge that you and I have before the Lord. Let's have a look at this. I wonder if Sarah can help zoom in. Um, here we have the map, a map of Israel. Um, I don't know if my mouse can do anything. I don't know if you can see it. Let's look right down. Okay, jump back again. Here we go. Right down south near the Dead Sea, you see uh, on the left-hand side, there oh, we have the nation of the Hittites. And the Hittites also had various other strongholds. Um, they were kind of an overall ruler of a huge empire that stretched right up into modern-day Turkey. But in amongst this are various other, there are parasites here on the south, south uh, western side, just near where the Philistines moved in. The Philistines began to move in here. They were actually uh, of uh, Celtic origin. They came from Asia Minor. They would moved in, displaced from Europe, and they'd actually come in there. And uh, the Philistines were iron users. But the Perizzites, uh, we'll look a little bit more about there. Here are the Jebusites around Jerusalem. Amorites were centered around here and also up here. And Amorites <coughs> um, were around there. Um, here we have Shechem. There were also um, uh, various, just remember that place Shechem is up there. Canaanites tended to be the broader group here on the coastline. The Girgashites were around there. They were not listed amongst that five, but they were present. And uh, we'll, we can talk about Girgashites tended to have the name meant somebody who turned back from going on a pilgrimage. And the idea of that word is basically a backslider. Someone who starts doing something good, but gives up on it. Gergeshites are a study on their own. We're not even going to look at that. Hivites tended to be up here in the north. And here we have the Sidon. Uh, Sidon and um, also descended from Canaanites. In fact, uh, if you go and do a DNA study of the people of Lebanon to this day, 
Um, they did a study of the DNA of some Canaanite skeletons they had found in this area uh, that were, they calculated about four, five thousand years old and found that the DNA was 90% the same as that of people currently living in Lebanon. So we've still got the same people living there that have always been there, very interestingly. And here we see those other nations that are not listed, but they were regular enemies. The Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites. Here we have Bashan and the Aramaeans. And um, they were the Sidonians, or they became the Phoenicians. But these five nations, or these six nations that are over here, um, excluding the Gergeshite, there are... There are those, um, those six nations, and they lived in that area. And they all had to be displaced and attacked. So let's carry on, and we will at least have an idea where everybody lived. Let's start with the Amorites. They were descended from Ham. And Ham, as you know, it was one of the sons of Noah. There were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem... Um, was the uh, ancestor of Abraham and Ham was one of the sons of Noah and one of his sons was Canaan. So the, all of those nations were from different sons of Canaan and Canaan defeated the Amalekites and moved into the hill country of southern Israel. And uh, when Joshua came in, he defeated the first two Amorite king, first of all Sihon and Og, and then five more warrior kings when they came in. Um, they eventually were not all killed, and they kept them as slaves, as serfs. And um, it was, uh, they never managed to completely live in the fullness of the inheritance as Israel, because they did not fully obey the instructions. Very interestingly, of the Amorites, many were very tall because they were intermarried with Rephaim. And who were the Rephaim? They were very much like the Nephilim of the time before Noah, where the so-called sons of God, the demonic angelic beings had um, consorted with um, with humans and somehow produced giants. Og was around four meters tall. Simply we know that because his bed was more than nine cubits tall, which works around four meters. He was a big guy, Og the king. And he had to have his bed made of iron to take his immense weight. And we remember that when Caleb and Joshua first went into the land, what did they come back and say? They're big. There are giants in the land. These were the Rephaim, and they were among the Amorites. They were big and nasty and scary. And they had to be killed. But Joshua defeated Sihon and Og. Wonderful story. Go and read about these stories. Very interestingly, he was the one who said, he came back, him and Caleb said, we can do it with the Lord. The other ten said, we're not going in there. We're not going to do that. Very interestingly, they were known, uh, the Talmud, which is the Jewish commentaries, say that the Amorites were masters of witchcraft. Obviously, uh, having had Involvement with demonic things that produced those kinds of relationships, they must have had incredible engagement with demonic forces. They were masters of witchcraft, and of course, idolatry, idolatry leads to destruction. And it means that they made, made deals with the devil. They gave the devil incredible control over them to have that feeling that they were in charge. So it was a very, very dark, dangerous and demonic environment that Joshua was going into. 
which is why he needed the Lord Jesus, why he needed the angelic. And very interestingly enough, God said he would send hornets in. Now, I don't know if you've ever been attacked by a huge swarm of hornets. I have, and it takes away your desire to do anything else but survive and get away from hornets. Now, I don't know what that must have been like, but God said he would send it in to drive these people out. And dealing with Amorites, you need to realize that you can't make deals with the Amorites. You've got to get them out. And if we have any kind of compromise with the devil in our lives, that's not good for us. We need to get rid of that. Let's talk about the next nation. Let's talk about the Hittites. Very interestingly, until about the early 1900s, all the archaeologists had said there were no such thing as Hittites. They could not find them. And there were, the Bible was the only place where they were finding references to the Hittites until the uh, archaeologists began discovering their cities, huge cities, and proof of a massive civilization. One of the greatest battles in the Old Testament time was between five to 6,000 chariots between the Hittite Empire and the Egyptians. It took place in uh, uh, southern Israel, on the border there, in one of the, the Hittite cities, the Hittites were barely defeated by the Egyptians and it actually gives us the first recorded peace treaty where the Egyptians and the Hittites promised not to attack each other or invade each other. And they put up these, these, um, these carved uh, peace treaty um, signs. And suddenly they began to realize that everything the Bible had said about the Hittites was true. They were descended from Heth, one of the sons of Canaan, descended from Ham. So there we have Heth going to Hit. Uh, um, and one of the, the sons of Canaan. And Abraham bought Sarah's burial cave from them. Um, and Esau married Hittite wives. Um they were polytheistic nature worshippers. Um, the Hittites also were very, very close to the Jebusites. They worked together. In fact, various people have said that the Hittites and the Jebusites are almost undistinguishable from one another. They were, they were so integrated. But um, they were also polytheistic nature worshippers. And Bathsheba's first husband, Uriah the Hittite, you read about him. Um, they ran a massive trade empire. Huge money power. As far back as 1300 to 1400 BBC. At least uh, 400 BC before Christ. And uh, they worshipped the gods of nature and the weather. Uh, if you look on the left hand side you'll see a carving. One of the gods they worshipped for example was a double headed eagle. The king of the sun. The king of the heavens. They called it, and you will find this double-headed eagle used in many places um, in other countries. Um, and it's a symbol of one of the gods they worshipped. And you will find that that thing keeps on repeating. That dates, that carving dates back very long, uh, very far back. Uh, they were the ancestors of the modern Turkish people. And they practiced sacred sex in their temples. Um... Their stories, if you go and do research on them, you'll find out about that. Um, it was very weird. And uh, a lot of tra the, the trade empire symbolized by the worldliness there. Uh, a very corrupt uh, environment. If you look on the right hand side here, you'll see their writing was in cuneiform. Which was little triangles stamped into clay. And uh, you can see... That this really happened. Let's talk about the Perizzites. Now the Perizzites were. Uh, it really means rural people. Who live in places. Without walls. And uh, in villages and small towns. Without walls. They were people. Who. Uh, 
did not. They rejected education and modern ways. They had no writing and no way of passing on its wisdom. And really they represent something we would call stubborn ignorance. You know, in, in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And to this day, we find people who are very stubborn about learning things, new things. Um, you think about in previous centuries, you know, when, when, when the motor car was invented, then the people would come out and say, you know, if God had meant us to go at that speed, he would have built us, given us wheels. Um, you know, you've got people who are very hard-headed and don't want to learn. And these kind of people are, in a sense, those who reject knowledge, not just uh, natural knowledge, but also spiritual knowledge. Um, and we find a lot of people like that today, uh, a lot of superstition and foolishness that we see. Um, they were a threat to Israel because they lived close to the Canaanites, and the priests and the Levites kept on falling into illegal relationships with them, uh, being unequally yoked. Even in the time of Ezra, when they were building the second temple, the priests were rebuked for having uh, relations and taking wives from amongst the Perizzites. So they stayed around for a very long time. Let's talk about the Canaanites. And you'll read about them in, in Deuteronomy 18, uh, verse 9 to 22. I read that bit to you earlier. Uh, they're idols, they're abominations. And this group is a group on its own besides all the other sons of Canaan. So those inhabitants of the land practiced those abominations. And many of them shared the same gods and the same practices. But the Canaanites were particularly bad in certain areas. They practiced the divination and the magic, which involved the sacrificing of children, consulting demons that were pretending to be dead people, and the destruction of the Canaanites was God's judgment against them in their sin. They had temple prostitutes, both male and female. Uh, they worshipped gods for fertility, and they were obsessed with sex, very much like the pornography that grips our society. The Canaanites were sex mad. And everything to do with that, it created an income. Uh, and uh, it was very, very corrupt and very perverse. And God hated it. It was something very sick. And um, pretty much like some of the stuff that we are seeing today. And um, the judgment of the Lord is coming on what we're seeing today, even more than what we saw in Canaan. Then we have the nation of the Hivites. They were mainly concentrated in northern Israel, but there were also some in the south. The Gibeonites were Hivites. Do you remember the Gibeonites? They were a nation, and they pretended to be coming from very far, that they had heard of Joshua, and they wanted to have a covenant relationship. So they pretended that they were coming and they brought all their moldy bread and said, no, this was fresh baked when we left and look how, how, how bad it is now. But they actually lived just down the road. And the Gibeonites uh, made a treaty with Israel, even though they were warned not to make a treaty with them, but they lied. But God still expected Israel to honor that covenant in spite of it being an illegal one. Very interestingly, because your yes is supposed to be your yes and your no, your no. And very interestingly, the Gibeonites, uh, that word um, Hivites, refers to a demonic unity, almost like a symbiotic relationship. They would think as one, they operated as one, and they, there was something creepy about the way that they worked. Uh, we would call that a hive mentality, much like bees or ants. They tried to have that way of thinking, and that's where that name comes from. And the verb um, hava means to lay out in order to live collectively. It describes investing one's personal sovereignty into a living collective, saying, 
I'm not me outside of us. And it was a culture that was very much like that. So nobody had an existence outside of the collective. It was their culture. Also, they were largely involved with deception. And very interestingly enough, the Chaldi word, which was Aramaic, another word for Aramaic, which was also a language used in that area, takes that same word and it means serpent. Somebody who is tr involved with trickery, someone who deceives. <clears throat> and we find that very often we allow deception in our lives. We deceive ourselves and uh, a year ago or so we did a whole series on deception. The last of the group that we looked at of the six nations is the Jebusites. As you know, the Jebusites occupied key cities, including Jerusalem. And we know that King David eventually managed to drive out the Jebusites out of Jerusalem uh, through the work of his captain that then became his general, Joab. And the Jebusites, uh, they occupied Jerusalem and several of the major cities around there. I think Hebron and a couple of others as well. And they were descended from Jabus, also a son of Canaan. Um, they had this heritage of spiritual insight, but not being in submission to God. So they had certain insights. You will remember <coughs> in that city had lived Melchizedek and many of their kings had spiritual perception. Many times other religions will know some truth, but they don't know Jesus and the way to salvation. But they know some truth. And this was very much the case over this. These people perceived what that was all about. I want to tell you a story. Um, they they um, occupied that. Now, very interestingly, within their territory lay the cave of Machpelah, which Abraham wished to buy. But they said to him, we know that God will give this country to your descendants. Now, if you'll make a covenant with us that Israel will not take the city of Jabus against the will of its inhabitants, we'll give you the cave and we'll give you a bill of sale. Abraham, who was very anxious to obtain this holy burial place, thereupon made a covenant with the Jabusites. Now, this story is in the kind of Jewish traditional literature what they call rabbinical literature. And the story goes that they made a covenant, Abraham made a covenant with the Jebusites, and they engraved the contents on bronze. When the people of Israel, some close to 600 years later, when they came into that area, they could not conquer the Jebus or Jerusalem because of the bronze figures. They could not conquer them because of that. And uh, because Abraham's covenant was engraved on it and they had these figures in the middle of the city. Because they knew what was coming, they had spiritual insight. And very interestingly, what had happened though was that they were also not allowed to attack Abraham. But the king of the Jebusites had, when Joshua first came into the country, gathered the Jebusites together, and attacked Joshua. And so they broke the covenant. And because of that, the covenant was no longer val valid. So all that had to happen was that uh, Joshua had to, or uh, the Israelites had to attack and destroy those bronze statues, according to the teaching, go into the place, destroy them, prove that the covenant was broken, and then they could have the city. And it is told that when Joab went in, he did that. Now, some of that information isn't in the Bible. So some of it may just be a story, but it's very interesting to know that at least we do know that whatever covenant would have been between the Jebusites and the Israelites, it was broken by them breaking it. And that was important. Now, <clears throat> what do we learn about the Jebusites? is that there are demonic covenants, but the covenant that Jesus made supersedes and makes invalid 
So if somebody, for example, gave their life to Satan, if they gave their life to them, Satan cannot prevent that person from calling upon the name of the Lord and still being saved. And if you have made bad decisions, you can still call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. Just hold that in your mind. Okay, let's carry on. Let's look. They broke their own covenant. They always lived alongside, but were never a part of Israel. They were part of the snares and idolatry. And they coexisted even in Jerusalem. In fact, the threshing floor that King David bought was from a Jebusite. And that was where the, uh, the tabernacle stood and is believed that that would become part of the temple complex. Um, there, let's talk about some of the spiritual warfare in Canaan. Let's kind of boil it down a little bit. The Amorites represent pride. The Hittites represent fear. Remember how afraid the children of Israel were to attack. They were terrified. Why? Because of the controlling spirit of fear. The Canaanites were merchants humiliate. Money was power. They intimidated these people with their incredible wealth and power. Then there were the Perizzites and they were lawless. They had a sense of anarchy, a sense of we'll do our own thing. <clears throat> a bit of the, the, the wild countryside. And uh, Proverbs 5, 25, 28 says, A city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. They were wild and anarchistic, the Perizzites. And the Hivites represented a demonic unity, a closed society based on sensuality and pleasure. And there were the Jebusites. Very interestingly, the first time you really meet the Jebusites was a, a chap called Shechem who came and raped one of the daughters of Jacob and Leah. And two of his sons, the brothers of, uh, sorry, um, of the, the daughter, name was Dinah. She, she had two brothers. One was Levi and the other one was Simeon. And they went and wreaked an incredible havoc, uh, killing a whole lot of these members of the family. So much so that God judged them and they never featured, they lost their place as second and third sons in the inheritance and neither of them Simeon or Levi ever had a full physical inheritance uh, the Levites had a different role but that was part of that that prophetic future because of their um, illegal revenge that they took just interestingly enough so they took illegal authority and um, they did that. Sexual oppression. Right, let's talk a little about, about the giants in people's lives today. What are the giants in your life? Um, what are the giants that, um, that you and I would see? Talk. The number one would be pride. And that giant is just as busy today as was back then. And... <coughs> Uh, other ones is idolatry, the many addictions that we have. Um, people today are addicted to various things, everything from their, their pocket screens to food to alcohol. Um, there are many addictions, drugs, even um, uh, uh, prescribed drugs, pornography. Many addictions, which are another word for idolatry. Things that people worship instead of God. And we see that. Some of that even is the love of money. The craving to have things. You might be addicted to shopping and getting things. The rush of doing that. And that can control your life. Anything that you put above God in your life can be seen as an idol. And many of us struggle with idolatry in one form or another. Uh, it, 
Another giant is fear and anxiety, fear or worry, the need to be in control. Very interestingly, when pride and fear meet up, we find this need to be in control. And we find people who are control freaks. It's a giant in their lives. And they need to be in control. Then we find rebellion against authority. And I ask myself, do we not struggle with that? Yes, we find that in our country many times the corruption of the authorities makes us reject them. And so, so we do. But at the same time, where it is legitimate, we have no respect for it. And so we do not allow ourselves to participate in things that are lawful. And we rebel. Um, many people are in habits. Things that we refuse to allow to change. Are there not habits in your life that you would say, Lord, I need to overcome this. Uh, it could be, uh, for example, oh, we'll come back to that one. Um, one of the giants that I have found lately... Um, that's happening a lot, is people getting offended. Uh, I've seen this happening twice in the last two weeks. Somebody becoming offended, and suddenly it changes the way they operate, and they start becoming incredibly bitter, and it ruins their relationships. And in this season, where people get are dealing with a lot of grief, it's really easy to get sucked into this. Where, uh, where people are dealing with anger and pain and all the symptoms of grief. To suddenly be offended and then it changes you. And we cannot allow. As I was explaining to <coughs> um, somebody earlier today. Offense is like a taxi. You're standing on the side of the road. It comes past you. You just let it go past. You don't put up your hand and say, I'm going to town. You just stand there. Let the taxi go past. When there is an opportunity for offense, step back from the pavement and say, I'm not getting on that taxi. I refuse to do that. I refuse to take offense. We have to watch our hearts. And if you've gotten on the taxi to that place, Get off at the next place you can and ask Jesus to help you. What are other giants? Habits. Gossip. Do you know how many times I see people becoming habitual gossips? And it creates a sourness in their spirit. And every time they start speaking, they are talking about other people and what they have done. And instead of praising somebody or celebrating somebody or saying you know what God blessed me here and even this person is a blessing to me <coughs> if you can't speak positively about people let's rather not say anything and let's rather guard our hearts and bless people because they are just as much loved by God as you and I so what are they let's we've we've seen that there are also mindsets. A giant in many people's lives, one of them is negativity. People who always expect something bad to happen. They're always going on about problems. Now, we find that people do that. Um, they might be chatting on WhatsApp and you'd be amazed how much negativity goes on in that. How many times a day do you see somebody just saying, you know, God is good. And I'm excited about him and I'm so grateful. You see that some of the time. But once you start talking to people, they have a negative expectation. Often one finds a lot of self-righteousness. It's a habitual way of thinking. Self-centeredness. Self-pity. Self. It's a prideful mindset. And if you've fallen into a way of, uh, of thinking... Watch what you are saying. Um, I know some people 
that should be loving people that are in their family. But every time they open their mouth, it's criticizing that person who they love. Why don't you rather spend your time praising God and thanking the Lord for the people that love you? Maybe that would help you. Uh, one of the other challenges is a poor self-identity. Don't see themselves as Jesus see themselves, seeing themselves as grasshoppers, and look how big the giants are. And people's sexuality, where it's out of alignment with God's word. And you know, there's many ways this can be. It can be sexual sin, where there is lust, where there is um, perversion. But sexual lack of alignment can just as easily be even in a marriage where partners are illegally, inverted commas, withholding physical intimacy from one another. And in God's eyes, that's just as bad as perversion. That is just as bad. And sometimes just because we see one thing as sin, we forget that the other one is also sin because a healthy sexuality inside marriage is important in the eyes of God. And there is commandments on both sides. We tend to see the commandments don't fall into sexual immorality on one side, but we don't see the commandments on the other side. And we need to then realign our thinking because both forms of sexual immorality speak about a way of thinking that is outside of God's best. And we need to come to a place where we have a sexual identity that is aligned with God's value about appreciating um, your, your, and understanding who you are. And that's if you're married. If you're not married, that all needs to be in Christ. And your, your sexuality is not evil. It must just be under the control of Christ Jesus and saying, Lord Jesus, help me to walk in alignment with your will. So there's some huge battles to fight. <coughs> and uh, I, I want to talk a, a couple of them. And uh, hopefully I can just sort of start landing this in the next minute or three. There are some huge battles to fight. There's a continuous, unrelenting spiritual warfare. Which is why I began this evening while talking about you can't just do this with 52 hours a year. This has to be a, a daily battle, walking in the victory, taking and possessing the land in your life, renewing the mind. That's one of the first ones. So we're going to know what are the battles that we need to fight. These are the things that we need to do to start overcoming those areas that I've listed. I listed a whole lot of those areas and you might have thought, how am I ever going to beat those? This is how you're going to do it. I want to get very practical. And I can't go too far because we're running out of time. But we'll continue this in the weeks to come. The first thing is to understand that we're in a spiritual war. And that Jesus has already won the victory at Calvary. The blood of Jesus changed everything. That was the game changer. So you, the victory has been obtained. But you have to now go in and possess your land. Number one, the way you're going to do it is renewing your mind with the Word of God. What does it say? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, But you, beloved, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. And then it goes on to say, which is your reasonable sacrifice? And then it says in verse 2, and I'm going to read it to you. In fact, I do have it here, and I'm going to jump in there quickly. There we go. There we go. Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So 
what I'm wanting to show you about, let's go talk about this for a moment. Renewing the mind, it's when your thinking is this way. Now, all of the areas where there are giants talk about those areas where our mind is out of alignment with God. But the remarkable thing about Scripture is that when you and I begin to take God's Word and prayerfully read it and think about it and meditate on it, it begins to wash the muck out of our minds and we begin to get that you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And the Word of God goes into your thinking and it just cleans all that muck out. And you begin to get a clear mind and you begin to get peace in your mind. And you begin to get a sense of, hey, you know what? This piece of land is now clear of enemy infestation. And the more we renew our minds, the better we're going to be able to live. And the more you're going to know that the giants don't live there anymore. Renewing the mind is the best first thing. Secondly, as you do that, the second area is that you get deliverance from demonic control. Many people who are believers have given space in their lives to the enemy. And once you start using the word of God that says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to pulling down strongholds. And that stronghold, so that could be any, and it says that's demonic occupations. And it says pulling down vain imaginations and any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Not only is it the, the stuff of renewing the mind and replacing wrong thinking, but where the enemy literally has got footholds in our lives. And those areas give us that victory. Then we will talk about restoring your identity in Christ. We're not going to look at that today. But you will have that opportunity as we're going in. So that you begin to start saying, I can now take that city. That city that I never could win, I now am going to take that city. Removing wrong city, wrong thinking, restoring who you really are. We will talk about putting off the old man and putting on the new man and how to do it. So that you can start saying, I can now take my inheritance. I can now occupy the territory. I can now feel like a whole person. And the more you read God's word, the more you look into this, the closer you're going to have to the victory that God has for you. So that's as far. Uh, there's just one more. And that is the washing of the mind with God's word continuously. We will be doing that. So that's as far as I'm going to go today. I know that it's been a long word. I know that it's been challenging. But I do know that I couldn't leave anything out. Because it starts in a place and it goes to a place. And this is where you and I need to be. Where we take God's word and we start saying, I'm going to do what Joshua did. And I'm going to take possession of the land. Father, I thank you today that you could speak your word to us. Lord, I thank you for helping us, that your word has impact in our lives, and that you are washing our thinking with your word. That in our lives and in our families, in our homes, we are going to possess the land that God has given us. We're going to take hold of everything that God has and we will see that manifesting in our lives, that we can walk in victory, that we know where we're going, that we have that sense, this is where Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work of the cross. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that victory. In Jesus' name, amen. I trust that that helped you. And uh, we look forward to continuing this and digging into the scriptures in the weeks to come. God bless you. Amen.